Last week I told you that Joseph was one of my favorite stories. Well, I get to tell you another one this week. Open your Bibles if you have them or break out your phones and don't go to Facebook, but go to the book of Ruth. I know it's going to be hard. It's going to be very tempting and you might want to open another screen, but just look, look at the, the book of Ruth for a moment because this situation that we find ourselves in in this moment uh, is, is so full of meaning and so full of feeling. This week's sermon title is God Feels. And so as I was thinking about ways in which we could uh, maybe get inside the head of God, uh, this was the story that came to mind immediately. And, and I'm going to start with the end of the text and say, it, you know, I don't know, it transports me back every time I hear this text to a wedding, maybe in the old days. Whither thou goest, I will go. Have you ever heard anybody drone on like that? Yes, I have. Okay. And, and, and they're singing, they're singing this text. It's actually a, a very beautiful song. Um, but it, it grabs a hold of you because here you have a, a woman, Naomi, who has followed her husband into a foreign country where they do not worship God and has done so for economic reasons. There's a famine. They leave because they cannot find food or they don't have enough food growing on their own land. And so they leave and they go to another land and they go to the land of Moab. Now, you deep Bible students, 10 points to the person who can tell me where the Moabites came from. Now, don't say it too loud. We do have some children in the audience. Ammon and Moab were the sons of who? Lot. Oh, but I thought his wife died in a because she became a pillar of salt. And if you haven't heard these stories, it probably sounds really crazy right now. <laughs> okay, enough said. It's the afternoon activity. I gave some people the afternoon activity, and I want you to know I was so pleased that I got a response back to say, I looked this up and I found some extra stuff because the internet is full. It's full, folks. You can go to places like Bible Gateway and other places to get explanations about things. So if you don't know who Ammon and Moab are, look it up because it's a really, really naughty story. Okay? And they became tribes and they had land and they lived next door to each other and their families grew and they were related to the Israelites. They were cousins to the Israelites. But when the Israelites came to Israel, they would not let them go through their land. You come through here, we're going to kill you. That's basically what they said. But in this time of famine, this family, Abimelech's family, Elimelech's family, had left and had gone into Moab. They'd lived there and their sons were born there and their sons grew up there and while they grew up, uh, their dad got sick. And their dad got sick and died. Now, this is, again, to be, un to, to be fair, just understand that these stories are being told assuming that you know how devastating that would be. Now, we understand how devastating it is to lose a spouse on the scale of stress, death of a spouse is like 300. It's the top of the scale. Okay? That scale is into the, into the hundreds like that, and, and, and death of a spouse is the top of the list of stressors in our world today. He dies, but that's not the end of it. It's not just stressful for Naomi. It means that she is now disconnected uh, legally from her holdings back in her town. She's now living away from her town in a foreign country, and now she's disconnected. It would be as if you no longer could go to the bank and, and, and withdraw on your money. You would feel 
uh, very, very much out in the cold. She then experiences even worse situation because both her children, her boys, again, boys, sorry, it's a male-dominated society back then. Well, maybe it still is. Um, we, we have both boys dying as well, Marlon and Chilean. This, this, this is terrible because they now have chosen Moabite women for wives and they love them. But these two, these two young guys die. And so we find ourselves in this moment at the borderlands between Moab and Israel. And you have Naomi saying, look, I mean, the, the, the biggest part of that text that we just read, that, that, that we just heard, you must understand, is Naomi talking about what is called the Leverite law. The law that said, if this husband dies, his brother is supposed to marry that wife. If you don't know these things, look up the story of Judah and Tamar, and you will learn how that worked out. It's very interesting, very interesting stuff. We don't do this today. We don't expect that a, a brother will marry a, a, the, the, the spouse of a dead brother. But they did expect it then, and that's what she's on about. So if you don't know what she was talking about, that's what she's talking about. If I was to get another husband and have two more boys, would you wait around for them to get old enough to marry? and then have children, because the idea was you needed an inheritance, you wanted an inheritance. Why am I bringing up this story? Because today we're talking about the fact that God has feelings. He has feelings. Last week we talked about the fact that God knows, and the fact that he knows so much. We saw that in the story of Joseph. He knows the future, he knows the past, and he works with Joseph to save the world. Here we have a, a more personal situation in which there has been another devastating experience by a family, and, and, and God, God is right there, not only in the traditions that Naomi is talking about, but also in the very moment with these three ladies. To me, it, it points to the fact that God, God knows about how we feel. God knows the, the pain of separation. I believe that he experienced that even more, in, in, in maybe in a way that we will never experience because we are not part of a trinity, <laughs> but that, that when Jesus dies on the cross, where's the Father? Where's the Holy Spirit? Jesus says, I and the Father are one. And now you have this, this oneness ripped asunder by death. It's no wonder, my friends, that in Revelation it says that, that when Jesus comes again with the new Jerusalem and, and, and everyone is raised who, who didn't choose to go and be with him, they're raised in the second resurrection to see that that. He is the king. He is the universal God. And every knee bows and every tongue confesses and every, every person realizes that this is terrible. This is, this is not where they should have been. But there goes a word throughout the crowd. That's our city. Let's go take it. And then something amazing happens that uh, we, we don't like to think about, but God gives these individuals what they ask for. No, his heart has been always about saving them, always about bringing them back home. This is what Naomi is talking about. I'm going home, girls. I'm going home. I don't have any other sons to, bring, uh, to, to have you be connected to me. I'm going home. Jesus has been wanting to bring us home. And there's going to be a huge number of those who have been alive on planet Earth from all the ages who will have said no. 
Imagine. Imagine how God feels about that. He's done everything, literally everything in his power, playing by his rules, which one must understand are not the rules employed by the evil one on the other side of the great controversy. He is a dirty trickster who, uses, who does not play by the rules. God stays true to his character and he plays by the rules which says, I love you. I created you. I have feelings for you. I want you home with me. Please accept the path known as Jesus. Accept that path and come home. Naomi's going home. And she, she knows she cannot give the girls what they, what they need. Now, I want you to know, too, that this Leverite law and, and, and the laws that the Israelites lived by were indeed, were indeed uh, things that they could think about and were within their power to make happen. But what Naomi is forgetting at this moment is... That she is a daughter. She is a, she is a servant of the living God who can do anything. And it takes a Moabite girl, Ruth to be exact, to remind her that God can do anything. And I am going to serve that God till I die. And I'm going to be right beside you, Mother Naomi. I'm going to stay with you. And where you live, I am going to live. Is not this the song that God hopes that we will all sing back to him? When he sings over us and says, I love you, I want you to come home with me, I've sent my son to save this world, I've sent him to pay the price, even though it's been devastated by sin, I want you back home with me. He sings that song over us every day, every day. Whither thou goest, I will go. Whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. My pe your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And I'm sure this means huge amounts to Brett and Vijay right now as they're looking forward to the marriage of their daughter to a handsome young man. These kids are saying these kinds of things to each other. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wed myself. We even use that verb, don't we? I'm going to wed myself to you. Well, guess what? God feels the same way about us. And he has, he has been singing his love to us since we left Eden. So there are several stories I just want to point out because you know, time flies by. What about Hannah? What about Hannah and Samuel? You ever thought about the feelings that must have gone through that woman? Okay, I'm going to just give you two snapshots. One is, she's at the temple and she's praying, the tabernacle, it's the tent of meeting, and she is sobbing. I mean, we're talking about the, 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 the eyes watering, the nose watering, the spit coming out of the mouth kind of sob, sobbing, sobbing. Eli doesn't see very well. He doesn't recognize what is actually happening. He just thinks she's a drunk person who is trespassing at the temple. He comes over and accuses her. And she, she wipes her face. She says, I, I, I'm not drunk. I'm just sad. Eli is mortified. He's mortified. And he quickly recovers, he listens to her story, and he promises her in a prophetic manner, this time next year you will have a son. Now friends, we have some miraculous things that are happening in this day and age with 
IVF in vitro fertilization. Yeah, it's expensive, but it works. And people are having children when they didn't think they could. Lives are being changed. Families are being formed. It's amazing. It's wonderful. And I praise God for it. She has a baby. Now, she does live in a polygamous relationship. Let's not forget that. And that the other wife has been torturing her by saying, nah, nah, nee, nah, nah. I have kids and you don't. But now she has a child. What does she do with that child? She comes and gives him back to God when he is weaned. It's a nice old English word for finished nursing. So he might be two, three, four maybe. I've heard of ladies going even further than that. And some ladies are going, oh, not me. But yeah. When you don't have formula, when you are the sustenance of your child, you, you, you go as long as you can. Many cultures still do that today. She brings him back and she places him at the feet of God by giving him back to Eli. Now, why do I tell you this story? Let's fast forward to the end of Samuel's life. Samuel grows up and becomes one of the greatest prophets in Israel. In fact, he is the last great prophet in Israel. And why, do, why, why is he the last? Well, you see, because the people came to Samuel and said some, some words, my friends, that, that when I even think about these words, I, I, I think about us, and I think about so much of of what we do and so much of what we think. And I think about these words. And you're going to say, Pastor, what on earth are you talking about? But these are the words. Maybe you can figure it out even before I tell you. We want a king, is what they told Samuel. We want a king like the other people. What, did they had? What, what they had was a direct connection to the God who loved them, the God who had brought them into Israel, the God who had, had, had rescued them and, and then planted them in the, the beautiful land. And they basically said, you know what? We don't really want to hang around with him anymore. So, you know, so close. He, he can be there. But would you please ask him, they told Samuel, would you please ask him if it would be okay if we could, you know, have the new model? We'd like a king. We don't want to have to come to you, Samuel, and ask you what to do. We, you know, because you're going to talk to God and then God's going to tell us what to do. And you know, we're not really sure we want God telling us what to do. Do you know what God said? Samuel, they are, not reject, they are not rejecting you. They are rejecting me. Don't you feel bad about this, Samuel? Yeah, you're going to be out of a job, but, you know, they're rejecting me. I bring this up because how do you think God felt at that moment? These are his peeps. These are his, 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 his special people. And they are saying, ah, you know, uh, uh. For your uh, adult reading this afternoon, I suggest the book of Hosea. And um, if you understand that in this world today there is more slavery than ever in human history. You'll get a little inkling of what it must have been like back in Bible times. So when Solomon says there's nothing new under the sun, he's not kidding. More slavery today than ever before in human history. And a lot of it to do with sex slavery. Read the book of Hosea and you'll weep. 
Because this is about God saying, you don't love me. Making one of his prophets marry a prostitute. And go and get her back from her pimps, not once, not twice, but three times. And no, they didn't have to grab her you know, from the marriage. She went willingly back with them. How does God feel about that? This is pain, my friends. This is, this is, this is huge, huge pain. Really quickly, three things from the New Testament. What do you think about the shortest text in the Bible? Anyone know what the shortest text in the Bible is? Jesus wept. And some people have now made it into a swear word or some kind of something anyway. It comes from the 50s or 60s. Man, Jesus wept. Kind of like an expletive. Yes. God feels. One of his best friends dies. Jesus is instructed, let's not forget, not to go and rescue him and keep him from dying. Read the story. Read the story Read the story. Matthew chapter 9. No, that's not it. Matthew chapter 12. Jesus wept because his friend had died. Yes. But Jesus wept more because the people that were surrounding this tomb where he was weeping did not believe in him. And they were God's people. They had the, the book. And they still did not believe in him. What about Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was a... We know this song since we were Scarlet's age. A wee little man. And you know what? He was a tax collector. And as a tax collector, he ha uh, was an ostracized person. Uh, ostraca is a proper word, and it simply means a piece of broken pottery that has been thrown out. It's no longer useful, except, of course, for notes. Did you know that post-it notes were not the first notepad? No. Broken pieces of pottery. How do we know this? Archaeologists have dug up broken pieces of pottery with Grocery lists on them. Yeah, you took a stick or some sharp implement, a knife maybe, and you wrote your grocery list on a piece of broken pottery when you went off to the market. Because you didn't just have a, a stack of post-it notes hanging around. So this was their way of recycling broken pottery. Ostraca. But it means thrown out of general usage. And this is what Zacchaeus felt so you can imagine this little piece of dried up pottery decides, I am of no worth, I am of no value. In fact, people want to kill me because I am a Roman stooge, tax collector for the terrible overlords. He climbs a tree. Really smart move. You get in that crowd, you're smaller than everybody else. It's not going to be long before somebody takes advantage of that moment in those cramped little quarters, those cramped little streets. And you don't come out alive. Smart. He climbs up a tree, hides behind its big leaves, and waits because he wants bragging rights. And he also wants to be back in the family more than anything else. But he doesn't know the way home. And along comes Jesus. He passes that way, the, the song says. And as the Savior passed that way, he looks up into the tree that nobody else had bothered to look up into because nobody expected to have a little man sitting in a tree. <laughs> 
Like I said, it was a good plan. It worked. Until Jesus, who, as of last week's sermon, knows everything. (laughs) Jesus knew that he was there. Jesus knew, in fact, maybe had been instructed that this was probably one of the very people that he was supposed to meet as he went through Jericho that day. He'd already met blind Bartimaeus on the front end, as I like to preach it, and on the back end, he's meeting Zacchaeus. Divine appointment. And he looks up into the tree and he says, Zacchaeus, you come down. Now, now I, I don't know about you, but this is Jesus, who is the savior of humanity. And he is zeroing in. The God of creation is zeroing in on one little guy. Zacchaeus, you come down. And then the next words just blew everyone away. Because I'm going to eat at your house tonight. You don't get it. Maybe some of you would be scared if I said, I'm going to eat at your house tonight. Oh, oh, I didn't clean my house. Oh, I don't have any food. Please, we'll go to Taco Bell. Jesus says, I'm going to come and eat at your house tonight. That meant that he was worthy. He was worthy. Come on. He shimmied down that tree. He stood beside Jesus and stuff started to come out of his mouth that you don't understand unless you have read the law. And I'm not talking about the law of America. I'm talking about the law of the Bible. Hey, uh, I, I, will, I will pay back four times everything that I stole. Every person I stole from, and I've got a record, every person that I stole from, <laughs> I'm going to pay them back four times over. How come four, not five? It's the law. And, 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 and I'm going to give half of what I own to, well, maybe half of what I have left. I'm going to give half of what I have left to the poor. Now, where does it? This is the law. This is what righteous Israelites would do. They would follow the law, and if they stole, they would pay back four times. And if they were generous and they knew to be generous, they would give to the poor. Remember Peter and John going into the temple, and the blind man is not even looking. He's just holding out his hand because he knows that there is a law in Judaism that says you should give to the blind man at the gate. If you want to look good to God, you're about to go to church, you might want to give to the blind man at the gate. So he's not even looking at Peter and John. That's why Peter says, look at me. Okay, just a little tidbit there, but it goes with this piece. Because off they go to Zacchaeus' house, and he eats with a sinner. So when, (laughs) when Jesus is accused later on, this man eats with sinners. I don't know about you, but I should say, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. You are willing to eat with sinners. Because I'm a sinner. I have told God, no. That makes me a sinner. Jesus utters a blessing upon that household That is exactly what Zacchaeus wants. From his heart, God says, Now this man is a son of Abraham. His heart's desire, his heart's desire was to be back in the family, was to be inside, not outside. And God's heart said, Yes. I want you back in the family. We don't hear about Zacchaeus again. Guess we'll have to wait till the kingdom to see what happens, see what happened in the rest of his life. And I have a feeling he kept his promise. I don't know if he kept his job with the Romans, but I think he kept his promise because he wanted to live in Jericho as a righteous man and be known not only 
as, as that, but somebody who cared about people. Because that's what God's law helps us to understand, is that he feels for us. And so he has put in place laws to govern our lives so that we can be blessings not only to ourselves, but also to others. God feels. John 17, Jesus says, Father, you have given me these people. I want them to be with me where I am. Father, I want them to be in me as I am in you. I want that, that loving relationship that we experience, Father, I want that to be what I experience with these people. If you've ever wondered, like, like I'm wondering right now, how does God feel towards us? I'm hoping that the review of some of these Old Testament, some of these New Testament moments will, first of all, it will urge you to dive into Scripture even more. Because I, I don't know about you, but when somebody writes me a love note, I'm really interested if there'll be another one. You know, and, and you know, if, if I've gone on a date like I used to date my wife, like I still date my wife, I'm thinking, when's the next one? Okay? Because it's, it's so wonderful to be together. I don't know if you feel like, you know, like I do about Sabbath. I think that Sabbath is a really great date that God set up at creation. You know, he said, I need to date you every week. I love you so much. I know you're going to be busy six days a week. But, you know, could you spare some time to just hang out? and be with me? That's one way of thinking of Sabbath. He'd like a date with us every week. Last, last story, because this is, this is just amazing. Uh, four guys, I don't know if it was four or more, but they had four corners of a sheet which they put ropes on, and they tied the ropes to, the, to that sheet, and then they put their sick friend on that sheet. And they took him to Jesus. Now, when they got there, the door was blocked. It was literally chock full of people. They could not lift their paralyzed friend through the door. They decided not to give up. They went up the steps, and if you look at, at, at Palestinian houses even today, they build them in stages because the family's going to live together and the oldest son gets the first apartment up above mom and dad and then so on and so on. So you see a lot of houses when you look at Israel and, and, and Palestine today and they still have you know, cinder block and rebar sticking up out of the top of the roof. And you think, well, why didn't they finish off the roof? Well, that's because there's going to be another layer. There's going to be another apartment. And so the steps are usually up the side and this is, this is the way they built even in Jesus' time. The steps would be up the side of the house, and then there would be the roof, and they would use the roof to dry stuff or to, to sleep sometimes in very, very hot weather. Those boys took their friend up on top of that roof, and then they started beating on the roof until they started pulling the clay away, and then they started pulling away the palm fronds or whatever other roofing material had been used until, until there was a hole in the roof big enough to take this, this hammock that they were carrying with their paralyzed friend in it and to lower him down at the very feet of Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but that's amazing love. To me, that's also a picture of what God did. He came to this world that was not expecting him, that was really busy with all kinds of other things, and he didn't let that disturb him from his, his goal of getting to us. He came another way in a stable in Bethlehem, and he scratched and scrabbled, and he, he, he opened up a roof, and he let down his son into this world. 
at our feet. And he said, if you believe on my son, your sins will be forgiven and you will be saved. That's exactly what Jesus said to that boy. Now, I'm sorry, church people. <laughs> the church people standing and sitting around Jesus at that moment did the unthinkable. So don't let's ever copy them. They questioned God's love and feelings for that boy. They questioned whether Jesus had the right to forgive him. Because they did not want to believe that he was God. Because they knew that only God could forgive sins. Only God could do what was necessary in order to reunite us with our Heavenly Father. And that this would indeed be the Messiah if they were to say, this is a wonderful thing. He just forgave this guy. And of course, the very next thing he does is he heals him and he stands up fully restored to his friends who are probably doing a jig on the roof saying, yeah, I told you, man, look, we brought him to Jesus and I knew it, I knew it, he'd heal him. God feels the same way about each and every one of you, about me. He wants nothing more than to bring us home. It seems with all the crazy stuff that's going on in the world that he's getting ready to do something. He's trying to get people's attention. He's, he's scratching the roof because a lot of people don't want him to come in. But he's trying real hard to come in and let us know just how much he loves us. So if, you, if you've been that person, please, just let him in. Let him, let, let him love you. He has such amazing feelings for you right now. It is literally indescribable from a human perspective how God loves us. If you have a friend who, who does not know this about God, do your, do your friend a favor. Tell them about this God and how he feels about them. Please. I think he'd like that. If you, you know, hand out invitations to the big party in the sky, he'd like that. Because you know what? John 3.16 says, For God so loved just Santa Clarita. Come on. Forget San Fernando. I mean, those heathens down there, they're all going to burn, right? No. For God so loved the whole world that he made a way. He gave his only son. And as some have said, he emptied heaven's piggy bank. That's how much he loves us.